So let's talk about explicit analysis for a mechanics problem. So the type of problems we've talked about in this class. So I'm going to write it down in sort of matrix form where you have And so, you know, so far in this class, we've ignored this term, right? And we just solved what's left. N now we're not going to ignore that term. And of course, uh, this has already been, you know, I wrote it in matrix form where I've assumed that the spatial discretization has already been carried out. So, M. is that K is that. So it's obvious I'm talking about elasticity here. So you, you might also write this as <clears throat> mass times the acceleration is equal to the external forces minus the internal forces. So the external forces would be these guys, right? So this is like external point forces applied to the boundary. These are uh, external surface tractions. I'm sorry, these are body forces, and these are surface tractions, right? So external forces. And internal forces are basically the stiffness matrix times U. So the, the terminology become, because remember, the stiffness matrix in, a, in an elasticity setting describes the material's resistance or resistance to internal deformation. So it's, it's internal resistance. So that's why we use that terminology. <coughs> OK? So we're going to assume the time step is between time n plus 1 and n minus 1. I'm sorry, and n. And we usually use the notation, I didn't like it at first, but I've gotten used to it. You'll see it a lot. This sort of half time step notation. So an increment or a change in a quantity that changes between n plus 1 and n, we usually use this half increment. So it's sort of, it's, it's centered at the middle of those two things, right? So you, you, this is notation you'll see a lot. I don't really love it, but you know, what's a half time step? But anyway, <coughs> so you can also define, you know, the time at that increment is and with that you can define the time step at n based on these half time step derivations. Okay, so with that, we can use central difference to approximate the velocity. first time derivative of u is the velocity. 
approximate the acceleration, the second time derivative of u, or a, based on those velocities. Okay, and then if you plug in, I think I might have to go, I'm going to go over here. All right, so then if you plug in, the central difference formula is for the velocities in terms of the displacements. So basically what I'm saying is plug in this guy here, you get And for delta t the same, meaning we're going to take increments, equal increments in time. So the way I've written it down so far is that every time step can be variable. And in general, that's how we do explicit calculations. We compute a critical time step, and we want to take the maximum amount we can every time so we can get on with it, you know. But, but so we, we are always varying the time step. But if, if delta t is the same, then you get the formula you're probably used to seeing. This should be, no, no, th this is just, this is also n plus half. I just, at that point, hadn't introduced the n notation yet. Yeah, so. Yes. Yeah. Yes, the average. All right. So everybody, I mean, if you took a class in numerical methods you've, or undergraduate differential equations, right, you've seen this central difference formula probably. All okay. So um, we're not going to solve any, you know, I'm not going to give you a homework assignment on, on these but just for reference, let's talk about, you know, sort of a flow chart of how you'd actually build a computation for explicit calculations. Right. So the first thing we'll do is obviously we're just going to initialize, you know, our initial velocity, our stress, our initial displacement, our initial time step and our initial time, right? And we'll, we'll compute the mass matrix. We're going to assume, if you remember back from the beginning of the course, I talked about Lagrangian you know, or Larian or, or uh, I think the terminology I, I more often used was um, 
the, the, the current the reference configuration and the current configuration. The refer another name for the reference configuration is Lagrangian. So <coughs> here we're going to assume that the, the this is a Lagrangian mass matrix. That, in other words, the shape functions are determined based on Lagrangian coordinates, reference coordinates, and from that, it will never change. So we can just compute it once up front, and so the mass matrix will not change. Right. So the thing, the first thing we'll do is compute. F O, and what I mean here is what I mean here is you know this this F is the internal forces or external forces minus the internal forces. Right? And if if there's no deformation at the at the beginning of time, then there's no in situ stress or anything like that, well then the internal forces are zero, initially. So then we compute the acceleration like this, the initial acceleration. And we take a, t a time step. And define our time quantities. We're going to do the first velocity update. And remember, velocity lives at this half time step. And I'll talk about why you might want to do a second velocity update later. We're going to enforce, now that we've updated the velocity based on the acceleration, we need to enforce any boundary conditions on the velocity. So we may have computed an acceleration uh, and we have a new velocity now, but, but we may be applying some external velocity boundary condition. And if that's the case, we need to kind of override the ones we computed with the ones we're applying because they're, they're constraints. Step eight would be to Compute F n plus 1. Compute the new accelerations. We're going to do a second velocity update to update the velocity to actually step n plus 1. And I'll talk about why you might want to do that. So on st at step five, we updated the velocity that we needed to then compute the new force, okay? But that velocity lives in this half time step increment. And if we don't, and that's okay, if all we want to do is compute the force and go to the next time step, we can skip step 10. But the reason to not skip it is you might want to check energy balance. And your kinetic energy, right, is going to be one half m v n plus one v n plus one, right? So we need the velocity at the time step in order to compute the kinetic energy at the time step, not in this half halfway point, right? And so, if we want to check the energy balance, then a good way to look for stability. 
is just to simply look at the kinetic energy, right? So it's a scalar thing you can just look at, right? And a lot of times what you'll do, write your simulation code, you can just have it print at each time step some information, and a really good piece of information to print there is a kinetic energy. So, you know, step one, kinetic energy. Step two, kinetic energy. Step three, kinetic energy. <coughs> because you're not going to actually, like, visualize. You're not going to make plots of stress and strain and everything at every time step. This is just something you can flash up at the screen, right? <coughs> or you can even have special checks in there. Because if you see the kinetic energy all of a sudden blowing up, increasing, this is the telltale sign of an instability in the computation. <coughs> right, because the, the kinetic energy should decay. So once you've done that, you can go back to step four and do it all over again, and you just keep going for as long as you want to run your simulation.